Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of our analytic philosophy circle and the special event related to this year's EU Analyticon. First, let me briefly introduce our analytic philosophy circle and say a bit about our annual conference. Our circle was formed in uh, uh, 2006 at the philosophy department of Euro Federal University. In that time, Ural State University. Typically, we meet almost every week to discuss uh, various uh, works in analytic philosophy, both uh, contemporary cutting edge works and classical works. And I'd like to introduce participants of today's discussion. Uh, Anna Maiseva from the Institute of Philosophy and Law, Siberian branch of Russian Academy of Sciences, Artyom Yunusov from the Institute of Philosophy of Russian Academy of Sciences, Ilya Gushin, Olga Kozareva, Victoria Sukhareva, and me, Lev Lamberov, all from the Ural Federal University. When it comes to EU Analyticon, as I've already said, it is our annual conference, uh, annual conference on analytic philosophy. We organize it since uh, 2011, and this year's conference was the 10th in a row. The organizing committee consists of Dmitry Ankin, Alexei Kislov, Ilya Gushin, Olga Kozareva, Victoria Sukhareva, and again me, Lev Lamberov. Our today's discussion is a kind of continuation of um, continuation of this year's conference where Christopher Peacock gave an invited talk at the plenary session. So, okay, let's head on to the discussion itself. And finally, let me introduce our speaker, Christopher Peacock, Johnsonian Professor of Philosophy, Department of Philosophy, Columbia University in the city of New York. Please, Christopher. Good, thank, thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Just nod if you can hear me, thank you. Okay, good. So thank you for the context and the background, the introductions, I appreciate it. Um, so um, Lev forwarded me um, a series of questions that I've thought about and printed out uh, here, but I think it probably makes sense to um, try to address those questions after a few more general remarks, um, doing what, um, Lev asked me to do. Lev asked me to um, say something about the evolution of ideas on the integration challenge um, since, since I wrote that book, um, which I'm blush to say was now 25 years ago. It was actually written, <laughs> published 24 years ago. Um, and uh, they, my ideas have evolved, um, but on large scale issues, I hope that um, they've not only um, deepened and got more fundamental motivations for some of the positions I took in the earlier work, um, but I hope generalized in various ways. Um, uh, there are some things on which I've changed my mind, but they're more, more on local issues and we can discuss that um, later when I discuss the questions you, you all submitted. Um, the, the major overarching development since I wrote Being Known and Formulate the Integration Challenge was the, the position that I outlined in, in my most recent book, the, the Primacy of Metaphysics. So let me say a little bit about the relation between that earlier book, um, Being Known, that formulated the Integration Challenge, and the more recent book. So the Integration Challenge, which you know, there's a standing challenge in philosophy in general, is the challenge of, for any given domain, of reconciling epistemology and the metaphysics of that domain. There are many, many areas in which uh, it's a kind of challenge to achieve that reconciliation. Um, it's an issue that arises in every area of philosophy, for every domain, um, but it's certainly more challenging for some than others. And um, as I said in the outline at the start of that book, um, when you find some kind of tension between your metaphysics and your epistemology, um, you have the choice of adjusting the metaphysics or adjusting the epistemology, or indeed adjusting both, or indeed in extreme cases, perhaps if you think no reconciliation is possible at all, that might be a sign that you've made a mistake, that there's any genuine 
topic there at all. Um, as I mentioned in the book, um, the idea of agent causation, for example, is a very, very problematic idea and um, maybe should be abandoned. Um, one, of the th one of the things I didn't notice when I wrote that book um, was that um, in each of the areas in which I uh, discussed how to achieve integration of the metaphysics and epistemology, I discussed um, the past, I discussed issues about self-knowledge, I discussed issues about the self, discussed issues about metaphysical necessity. In each of those areas, um, I actually ended up giving an account on which um, I specify the metaphysics of the domain in question, where it's domain of um, uh, a certain first personal states or domain metaphysical necessity. And then I um, connected the um, a good epistemology for that domain via a theory of understanding. And the theory of understanding in epistemology um, was answerable in various ways to an explanatorily prior metaphysics. Um, some, some years after I finished the book, uh, I began to address the question and think much more generally, is, is there some general abstract theoretical reason for thinking that the metaphysics of domain um, is always involved in, is always involved in um, a good account of uh, concepts of domain and the epistemology of domain. And um, I, I came to the conclusion that um, the metaphysics is always involved. And I, I came to consider um, what in the, um, the 2019 book in the Primacy of Metaphysics, um, I came to consider what I call the primary thesis. And the primary thesis just simply states that um, the metaphysics of a domain is involved in the philosophical explanation of the nature of concepts of that domain or the nature of meanings of sentences about that domain. And the metaphysics um, is involved in philosophical explanation of the nature of intentional contents concerning that domain. Involved in doesn't necessarily mean prior. It, maybe there's kind of no priority between the two. It's always involved in. Um, each of the uh, case studies that was um, that were developed in being known um, exhibit such involvement. Um, but you know, case by case is is one thing. Um, it's always interesting to do. But um, as always in philosophy, you want generality. You want some explanation of of why why this should be so. If it if it is so, and I came to the conclusion. I came to the um, conclusion that there's a very simple argument um, that there always is such involvement of the metaphysics of a domain. Um, in the account of the nature of intentional contents concerning that domain or the meanings of sentences um, about that domain. And the very simple argument um, uh, has just two premises. Um, uh, the, um, the first step of the argument concerns the nature of concepts or meanings in general. So uh, we're concerned here with um, concepts in the sense of Frege's notion of sense, we're concerned with modes of presentation, and um, the classical Fregean idea is that you individuate a sense, or makes the sense the sense it is, you individuate a sense by giving the fundamental condition for something to be its reference. You individuate a sense by giving the fundamental condition for something to be its reference. Um, that's, that's in Frege, it's a guiding constraint in the formulations in um uh in his uh, philosophy of arithmetic um it's it's there extremely extremely explicitly in um the um in the grungesetzer um but of course it's a completely it's a completely general doctrine it applies to concepts by which i mean senses whatever the subject matter, whether it's arithmetical, whether it's demonstratives, first person, indexicals, observational predicates, theoretical predicates, any of them. Um, uh, that's, that's the classical Freudian idea, but there's an elaboration of that idea. There's a, a kind of expansion of it 
um, which turns to an issue that was really not properly addressed by Frege. Um, for all his great contributions um, and all the talk about the the third realm, the realm that was you know beyond the mental and beyond the physical, the third realm of, of thoughts of the Gedanken. Um, Frege said next to nothing, I often just say nothing, but next to nothing, um, about what it is for thinkers to stand in certain relations to those entities, to those denizens of the third realm. Um, and if you're concerned with the nature of understanding and grasp of sense, you talked about grasping a sense all the time, but he didn't actually say what that relation of grasping was. Um, one way of um, respecting the idea that um, a sense is individuated by the conditions under its reference, but while also saying a little bit more than Frege said about how thinkers are actually related to these entities in the third realm, one, um, one way of doing that is to put forward the general elaboration, it's taking things a further a step forward beyond what Frege said, um, by stating the following, that a, a concept, a mode of presentation, a sense, um, for any given concept C, whatever category, it's a singular concept or a predictive concept, a concept um, is individuated also by the relation in which a thinker has to stand in order to be thinking of something under that concept. Let me say it again very slowly. Um, for any concept C, there's a corresponding relation R of C, and it specifies the relation in which a thinker has to stand to that thing in order to be thinking of it under that concept. Um, you can think of this um, as a universally quantified, um, two universal quantifiers at the start, if you like, for, um, for any concept C, and for any entity you like of whatever category, um, uh, there's a relation R of C such that for the thinker to be thinking of the entity under that concept is for it to stand in that relation. And if you, if you formulate matters that way, then um, various things emerge. First of all, there is this real interesting substantive challenge for each concept saying what that relation is. Okay, that is a task. If that's a true general thesis, there must be some, um, some relation um, in which a thinker stands when the thinker is capable of thinking of that object under that mode presentation. Um, and it should, you know, philosophical task to say what that is. And indeed, a lot of classical issues in philosophy can be regarded as, as attempting to do that. If you, um, if you take the great historic contributions that have been made about the first person way of thinking. Um, uh, you know, as I said in one of my books, this, this is a topic that has absolutely entranced philosophers. There's um, very few great philosophers who haven't one way or another made some contribution and sometimes made some terrible mistake <laughs> about what it is to be thinking of an entity under the first person mode of presentation. What relation do you have to stand to something in order to be thinking of it under the first person mode of presentation? Um, uh, and of course, it, um, in other cases, it's relatively straightforward. So if you take the um, a perceptual demonstrative, so suppose I'm actually in the same room as you, holding up my wristwatch, and if I say this, that watch, that wristwatch, um, uh, that's a demonstrative mode of presentation of an object and the relation in which um, a person has to stand to the demonstrative mode of presentation in order for it to be a demonstrative mode of presentation of that object is that that object, in this case the wristwatch, um, is the one that um, appears to be at a certain egocentric distance and direction from you. That's what makes it, that's what makes the reference, the reference um, that, that wristwatch. I said um, there, I hope carefully, um, that it's the one that appears to be in that direction. As you all know from the literature on perception, something can appear to be in a direction that it isn't in fact. 
Um, but that object has to play, is that's the object that's um, presented to you as being in that certain distance direction from you. And it's a different concept if something is given in a different egocentric direction, even if it happens to be the same object. It might be the, the same the same wristwatch, but um, you don't realize you're looking at it at the mirror, for example. Um, so the, the Fragian identity, that wristwatch is that wristwatch that will be informative, different senses. Um, and indeed, different relations in which you have to stand to think of things. So the idea would be that when it's a different relation, which you have to stand to something to be able to be thinking with under that concept, it's a different, it's a different sense. Okay. So that's the um that's one of the two premises. Um uh something that I think if you use the notion of mode of presentation at all, I think it it ought to be relatively uncontroversial. I think it's an illuminating way of thinking about modes of presentation and senses. It's something that um retrieves or at least makes accessible Frege's Frege's third realm. It doesn't um put it in the realm of the inaccessible, it connects um real relations of thinkers to, to grasp of grasp of senses. Um, but now um uh here's the um here's the argument. Uh, which which relations a thinker can stand in to something. Uh, depends on the kind of thing it is. Okay. The, the metaphysics of some entity or some property or whatever it is you're thinking about, the metaphysics of that entity um, substantively constrains what relations you can stand into it. So you can't stand in causal relations to a natural number. Um, um, and because that's so, whatever is involved in thinking of a number as the number seven or thinking of it as the sum of two other numbers or whatnot, um, your account of what it is to be employing that mode of presentation cannot use any kind of, of causal relation. Same goes for, um, I would say, for, um, uh, for metaphysical necessity, um, the modal status of, of some propositions, possibility or its necessity is, is not something that could have a causal influence on you. And so whatever theory of necessity you want to adopt, um, you're going to have to not require the standing causal relations to you. And um, quite generally, those two, those two premises, the first premise about sense being individuated by um, the relation in which you have to stand to something or to be thinking of in that sense, and the um, point that what relations you can stand into something depend on the metaphysics of, of that thing, the domain from which it's drawn, um, they already imply, they already imply then that um, there's, uh, the metaphysics of some domain is involved in, I just use a very general notion, involved in um, an account of the nature of intentional contents, meanings, um, uh, the concern, concern that domain. Okay, that's a very general abstract argument. Um, Austin Linnebo, whom I know you know from previous meetings, described this as the as the master argument, and I'll follow his terminology there. So that, that master argument is compatible with um, two different um, cases, and it's incompatible with a third case. And let me talk about these cases then. So in some cases, um, in some cases, the metaphysics of a domain is not merely involved in the account of the nature of intentional content, it's actually explanatory prior, explanatory prior. And in the order of philosophical explanation, it's prior um, and everything um, to do with the nature of concepts in that domain um, has to be explained in terms of the um, philosophically prior metaphysics. Um, I believe there are interesting metaphysics first cases. Um, uh, I discussed um, uh, several of them in the um, uh, in the more recent book, and um, the, as I said before, the treat the actual treatment of the cases on the past, necessity, and so forth, in being known, each of those was um, a metaphysics first case. Metaphysics first case is not the only kind of case that's consistent with that general kind of involvement, the involvement of uh, metaphysics with the theory of intentional content. Um, it's also possible there could be what I call no priority cases. Um, so the primary thesis just by itself just says that the 
metaphysics of domain is involved in the philosophical explanation of the nature of meanings of senses, but it might also be that the, the concepts are involved in the metaphysics, right? Involvement is um, not just by itself an asymmetrical relation, and there are certain, um, uh, certain classical cases that we discussed in Western philosophy that um, clearly seem to exhibit um, a no priority feature. So um, one of the um, most famous cases is the classical Lockean or Galilean account of secondary qualities of colors, smells, tastes, and the rest. Um, in those cases, um, the primary thesis still applies. I, the primary thesis, as I said, applies everywhere that the um, the metaphysics domain is always involved in the um, account of the intentional contents concerning that domain. But in those cases, if you take anything like the classical secondary quality view, um, concepts of some sort or other are also involved in the metaphysics because for something to be read is said is for it to appear read in certain kind of canonical circumstances. Of the notion of looking read, seeming to be read, um, being experienced as read will be in, a, in, an, in the account of the metaphysics of, of redness. Um, and therefore those would be those would be no priority cases. Um, and it's a very interesting question um, how far the is the extent of the no priority cases. Interesting, interesting issue. But there's a third sort of case that is is ruled out, is ruled out by by the primary thesis. And that's the so-called meaning first cases or intentional content first cases. Um, it, it cannot be true um, if the primary thesis is correct. It cannot be true that um, uh, the meanings or the intentional contents are individuated independently of the metaphysics. That 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 would be in conflict with the um, those two, the joint effect of those two premises. The if a if a sense is individuated by the relation in which something has. You, the thinker has to stand to something or to be thinking of it under that sense, um, and that constrains the metaphysics, then that's a, that, sorry, that constrains the nature of that relation, um, then metaphysics is intrinsically involved. So the primary thesis is in head-on conflict with various kinds of views that are found in the philosophy of language and the theory of intentional content. Um, it's very, very explicitly in conflict with um, the views of Michael Dummett in his not his last book, but his last really large book, um, so-called Logical Basis of Metaphysics. And he says very explicitly throughout that, that metaphysics has, as a discipline, has no independent standing at all. You can make various metaphysics claims if you like, but they're all just um, ways of talking about the theory of meaning. You do not need metaphysics at all in giving a good account of intentional content senses. Um, and there's quote after quote that um, you can find uh, from Dummett. Um, saying that, um, uh, but the it's not only Demetian views that are um, that are ruled out by this this primary thesis. There, um, if you take Bob Random's account of uh, meaning and intentional content in his the big book Making It Explicit and many later expositions of his views, um, that's a kind of conceptual role view, a view under which um, meaning is explained in terms of reasons for making making judgments. And um, it's a part. It's explicit. It's part of his view that reference plays no fundamental role in the account of those um, the account of meanings under under his own account of meaning. A conceptual role somehow fully individuates a sense, subject to certain constraints. Um, I disagree with that for for lots of reasons. I don't think you can give a good account of meaning plainly reference, but certainly um, uh, if reference has to be brought in. Um, then there's a question of what relation a thinker has to stand into something um, to uh, be thinking bit, thinking of the reference under, under that sense. Um, the, sometimes, of course, a, a thinker may think about, somebody may, a philosopher may reflect on a domain and come to a conclusion that um, you, you just can't reconcile all these demands. You can't give a good account of metaphysics and epistemology. It integrates via a theory of understanding. And expressivist views of some domain, expressivist views in, um, especially in um, 
morality, but expressivist views have also been expressed about necessity. For example, you'll find expressivist views, expressivist treatments of, of modality in, in Simon Blackburn. Um, uh, that's again another possible reaction to this argument. I find those views extremely implausible, but the argument gets a grip. The argument for the primary thesis from those two premises gets a grip only if you're using a notion of reference. If you if you if, if you don't think the notion of reference plays any fundamental role in some domain, then um, then the argument argument doesn't apply. Um, express uh, we can discuss for any particular area whether an expressive view is correct. But if you are introduced, if you do have some notion of a reference that's ineliminable, um, then then the argument gets gripped. Then the argument applies. Um, I would say anyway. Um, so just standing back for a moment, um, what I want to say is that the this general theoretical argument um, in the in the later book, in the Primacy of Metaphysics book, um, I think helps to explain the, the shape of the earlier position in being known and the integration challenge. Um, as I said, I addressed the integration challenge topic by topic um, in, in the earlier book. And in a certain sense, I always did it in a certain form because I did it via a theory of understanding. Um, I, I talked about what it was to grasp concepts in the rest of the domains, each of the domains I talked about. Um, but I didn't at the earlier time have this this general abstract argument that the metaphysics must always be must always be involved. And indeed, if I had had that, I would have I would have put it in, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, so uh, I see the later developments. So answering Leb's question about what is the evolution of my ideas on this, um, there's uh, there's nothing in the later book that's that's um, in the later general thesis that's incompatible with the earlier approach. I see it as I hope. Some kind of deepening and further motivation um, for the positions for the positions developed there. Um, and indeed, in the in the later book, the accounts always go via the theory of understanding, the theory of concept possession, um, just as they did in various particular cases in the in the earlier book. Okay, so um, Lev, I don't know what the most useful thing for me to do at this point is. I'm very much in in your hands. I mean. One thing I could do is to take one of the areas that's discussed in the later book and say how the metaphysics first view, for example, plays out. Uh, the obvious case to take would be would be magnitudes. I could talk that for a bit. Alternatively, I could um, turn straight away to some of the questions that, that come up um, on the questions you sent me, um, because many of them in one way or another will illustrate the positions of the of the later book. I'm, I'm completely in your hands. What, what would you prefer? So I think that since uh, since the answers for the questions I, I sent you related to the exposition of your point of view, then I guess we can continue with your answers. Okay, we we'll do that first. And then it may be that issues will come up that require um, some more general discussion and I will, with your permission, then sometimes go back into mini, yeah. mini, mini lecturing format. Okay. Um, but the, uh, okay. So let me, um, let me take the, the first question. One of the, um, before I read out the question, um, uh, I discussed issues of self knowledge in the um, in the earlier book, and then in the in the later in the later book in the primacy of metaphysics, I focused very much on the um, the nature of the first person concept, the first person mode of presentation, first person way of thinking of something. Um, and in the earlier book, I. Um, Took and indeed, I, in the later book too, I take what's broadly an anti-human position, an anti-human position. Um, in the earlier book, I said that it was in the nature of a conscious state um, that it had to be the conscious state of a subject. Um, that um, in the case of conscious state, what makes it a conscious state is that being in the state is such that there's something it's like for the subject of that state. You couldn't make sense of the idea of a conscious state without there being a subject who's the um, 
whose state it is. Um, and by itself, that already undermines a Humean bundle type of metaphysics of the self, because the very idea of the very metaphysics of a conscious state requires it to have a subject. So you can't help yourselves metaphysically to some prior notion of a, um, a mental state or event um, that you then hope to build and bundle together with others to make a subject in the way that David Hume wanted to, um, because uh, you're already involved in the ontology of subjects in speaking about mental events themselves. Um, that's the argument I gave in the, the book of a quarter of a century ago. And um, I think it's sound as far as it goes. Um, it has the disadvantage that um, it applies only to conscious states. <laughs> and um, uh, some general consideration here should um, be available for um, un unconscious um, mental states as well. Um, um, I came when I, I came to think more about these issues because I've always spent quite a bit of time thinking about perception. Um, I came to think more about the question of um, what it is for a perceptual state to have a certain kind of um, content, what it is for a perceptual state to represent the telephone is in this direction, a door just behind you, and so forth. And um, it seemed to me that a good account of what it is for a mental state to have um, such a practice condition concerning a subject's environment had to speak of the significance of that state for the future actions of the subject of the state, okay? You can't give a good account of what it is for a perceptual state to have a certain kind of contact without speaking of its explanatory significance or later actions by the subject of that state, okay? The subject of the state, that's what gives it, gives it a content. So I think, and that can be true even of, even of unconscious states. It's, um, if you look at the psychological literature and literature on cognition, um, there's a huge range of organisms that have unconscious perceptual states with representational content, and indeed, so do human beings too. If you look at the um, Milner and Goodall, um, Goodall literature, there's just a um, huge, huge amount of evidence of this. For those states too, it's true that um, what it is for the state to have the content it does um, is for it to have a certain kind of significance in combination with other states for the subject of that state's future actions. Um, that means that even in the unconscious case, you, you can't apply the, the Humean view. The, these things are not available in advance, these mental states, because these, these mental states themselves involve the metaphysics of subjects. They involve um, subjects um, having certain properties, subjects existing. Um, okay. So, um, in, the, um, in the chapter on the self, in the later book, um, I tried to give an account of the first person way of thinking that um, integrated the metaphysics and epistemology um, and in a way that actually um, is in fact a metaphysics first view, metaphysics first treatment of the first person, but not, not a no priority view. In this case, in the case of the first person, um, no priority views have found a lot more favor uh, with various Thinkers, um, uh, I don't agree with them for all sorts of reasons. Um, but as um, as the two questioners formulate in the first question quite quite properly, um, they raise the question of um, what what is then the metaphysics of um, subjects that are referred to by the first person if you have a metaphysics first view of the um, uh, of the first person, first person concept. So let, let me read the question so we can focus the questions here. So this question is from Anna and Olga. They say, in the sixth chapter, you stand, you stand that the first person pronoun I as a referring expression refers to the subject of experience. Um, and they go on, to meet the integration challenge for first person judgments, one needs not only to accept the referent of I exists, but also explain what kind of entity such a referent is, i.e what ontological status this referent has. Um, completely has done kind of ontology. Could I clarify my views on the question? Yeah, so it's important and genuine issue. And indeed, you need to have a metaphysics of the of subjects that 
integrates with epistemology and if you're putting forward a metaphysics first view of the first person that question has to be answered um so the answer i give is is essentially in the chapter on the self in the in the 2019 book in the primacy of metaphysics um what i hold is this um i hold that um for a subject um, at T1 to be identical with a subject at time T2, they have to have what I call the same integrating apparatus. It has to be an integrating apparatus. I don't think you can make sense of subjects experience with that and having some kind of apparatus that integrates sensory experiences, emotions, thoughts, um, tryings, intentions, and so forth. Um, and uh, this integrating apparatus um, obviously has to have some kind of physical realization. It doesn't. It doesn't require that um, it act, the integrating apparatus actually be in control of a body. You can certainly make sense of um, subjects of experience whose that are brains in bats or integrating apparatuses of some kind. Um, but it is. It is true. I think that the notion of an integrating apparatus and various fundamental kinds of mental states like perceptions, intentions, beliefs. Um, I would say that they are coeval with one another. Neither of them, none of them is metaphysically prior to the other. So an integrating apparatus um, obviously integrates sensory states, perceptions, beliefs, appetites, desires, and so forth. Um, and to produce action. Um, but I don't think you can make sense of any one of those um, kinds of mental states or entities without making reference to the others. I think you have a tight, tight little interrelated um, circle of notions here. I think it's what I call a local holism. It's a local holism in the sense I used in earlier writings. Um, the metaphysics of any one of these things, uh, perception, uh, belief, action integrating apparatus if you trace the met that metaphysics of any one of these you'll get you'll have to draw in the others no, no one of them can have their nature explained without their being um, simultaneously related to the others so for example to take i already mentioned perception i think that for perception to have a certain content um it has to have a certain significance um for the later actions of that subject of the subject of experience um, so the very idea of an integrating apparatus, if it's integrating perceptions, um, is already involved in the notion of a subject. Um, so there's no kind of metaphysical reduction of any one of these notions to any others. If you take the whole of the um, David Hume project and neo humans like, um, like Derek Parfit, um, all that whole long tradition in philosophy has presupposed that there's some kind of atomistic um, mental states, perceptions, desires, hopes, fears, other conscious states and events um, that are available metaphysically in advance of um, subjects of experience. And I think it's an illusion. I don't think you can say what it is for anything to be a conscious state, to be a perceptual state, even an unconscious perceptual state, without bringing in um, subjects. Um, and so um, my answer to this question, um, what, what, yeah, can I say exactly what this ontology is? Um, I would say it's an ontology of, of subjects um, uh, whose identity conditions depends on the identity of an integrating apparatus. Um, uh, that's consistent with subjects of experience um, getting new bodies or indeed having no body at all, as long as the integrating apparatus is the same. I don't think the integrating apparatus can be, its nature can be explained independently of these various mental states. But I would also very strongly argue, and this was something I argued um, in a book I haven't mentioned today, the, um, the, the book on the first person and subjects of consciousness, the, um, I don't know, it was the 2014 book, The Mirror of the World. Um, I argued there that there can be um, subjects of experience that represent um, what's in fact their environment without having any kind of first person mode of presentation or thought. They don't have any kind of first person, either conceptual or non-conceptual. So these are subjects of experience who um, 
they will have a here and a now in the content of their perceptual experiences. Certain things will be represented in this direction, that direction. Um, they can even build up um, uh, maps of the world at various times. They can have a cognitive map of an environment. They can even think about this body, um, but they don't have a first person. They don't have a first person. That's um, this is very important. It's very important because it's um, it's that possibility that opens up and makes available a metaphysics first account of the first person way of thinking because you can say what relations a first person way of thinking has to have to um, a subject that has these more primitive states um, that makes it the first person way of thinking without being involved in any kind of circularity if you if you think, if you did, if you were to think, someone who did think that um, there was, that in perceptual content and in mental states generally, there was always a first person component in the content itself, as indeed some continental philosophers have held, um, not rightly, I think, but there has, has been held. If you thought that, you, you'd have to have, you really have to have a no priority view of the first person way of thinking. If you, there wouldn't be a, um, a prior metaphysics to, um to relate grasp of the first person to um but i do think i do think there can be subjects of this, and i i suspect there's many organisms in the world actually that do um uh have perceptions perceptual states with spatiotemporal contents um have a here have a now they represent an objective world um but they don't employ the first person um, and it's because uh, you can anchor what mastery of the first person is to such states. Um, you can, over that more primitive level, you can build an account of um, what it is to be thinking of yourself as in, as oneself, as me, um, that the, uh, the metaphysics first account of the first person is available. If you don't think that can be done, then you'd have to have a no priority account. Um, and the, the, the basic, um, the primary argument I gave earlier, the primary thesis and the arguments for it still apply, but um, you'd have to have a different account of, of the first person. Um, uh, so let me ask the question is, is that, do you want to do follow ups on that? Is there any, um, like me to say more? Um, I guess those who ask this question should say something. Probably. Olga or Anna, yes. <laughs> yes. I'm happy to say more if you want more. No response either. I'm, I'm, I'll check in the chat as well. If um, I should open the chat, just open the chat. Just yeah, it case. looks like they are overwhelmed with your answer. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, if things, you know, if questions bubble up in your mind, put something up in the chat later or, or email, yeah, okay. Okay, um, let's let's move on to the um, to the next question then. Um, yes, yeah, so there are two um, two parts to the first question. The first um, question about what um, Annalisa Kaliva says about um, the views of self knowledge um, uh, in the in the earlier book and in some articles. Um, yeah, could I please address um, objections? There's different concepts, two different concepts of a conscious mental state, neither of them sufficient to explain why it should be considered as a reason. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't agree with her view that neither of them is sufficient to explain why such mental states could be considered as a reason. One of the, one of the things that I, um, one of the distinctions I drew in some stuff a long time ago now, um, it almost seems like another life. Anyway, I drew a very sharp distinction between um, Uh, occupying attention, something occupying attention, and something being an object of attention. Okay. So um, suppose I'm engaged in intensive reasoning. I'm trying to um, prove some mathematical proposition. Or I'm trying to reconcile two things, or I'm trying to see where I went wrong in a calculation. Or um, that's um, that can occupy my thoughts, completely occupy my, occupy my consciousness. Um, 
But the, the reasoning itself is not an object of consciousness. It's not something, um, it's not something I attend to. I, what I'm attending to is the mathematical problem or the logical problem. Um, but it's occupying my attention. There's a very, very important distinction between um, occupying attention and being the object of attention. I'm not even sure your thinking can be an object of attention, actually. It's not the kind of thing you can attend to, but it can certainly occupy your attention. Um, and so can thinking more generally, and so can other, other states. Um, uh, and if you look at what um, Annalisa Cleaver says um, in the article that's mentioned there, um, she talks about cases in which attention is occupied, but she keeps saying that, well, this must involve all kinds of conceptualization of the um, of the state that's occupying your attention. You must be thinking of it as this, thinking of it as that. And because of that, um, it would be circular for me to give you the mechanism. So I, I don't agree with the starting point. I don't think you need to conceptualize a state um, as the state it is for it to be occupying your attention. As somebody can be engaged in reasoning and thought without even having the concept of reasoning or thought. You know, it's a moderately sophisticated thing where children can be, you know, attention can be occupied in doing all kinds of things um, mentally without conceptualizing them as the, as the mental states they are. Um, so I, I didn't really agree that that's, um, that she's shown that that direction of explanation is blocked. I think um, I think this uh, notion of a conscious state under which um, it's uh, occupying attention but could still be um, a reason for making a self ascription um, is okay by me um, without without circularity. And if you think that's wrong, um, you know, come back to me on that too. But um, but I'd say um, that um, that chapter that was written. 25 years ago now, um, things have moved on in that domain. There's just been a huge, huge illuminating amount of work um, on self-ascription. And um, there are some um, there are some models uh, that I I failed to consider in, in the book and failed to consider earlier, actually, in a study of concepts. Um, uh, I'm I'm particularly interested in um, views of self ascription of attitudes um, that make use of the idea that a single mental event can have multiple contents, can have a lot of different contents simultaneously. And um, uh, it, it so happens that the person who's written most on this approach to overlooked is my own daughter, <laughs> Antonia Peacock, who, if you look her up on philpapers.org. Um, there's an approach to self ascription when you, um, uh, under which, uh, when you're, for example, addressing the Evans, the Evans question, you know, will, um, do you believe there'll be a third world war? And you consider whether, you know, what the evidence is, and you come to, there isn't really two different tasks of, first of all, seeing what the evidence is and then assessing your own belief. You, you one and the same judgment, both is a self ascription of a belief and is also a um, judgment that, let's say, there won't be a third world war, as we hope. Um, so that's that's an option that I I really missed. I, I missed it right back in right back in 1992, actually, in the study of concepts as well. I, I said it was a constraint on certain kinds of self ascription that you'd be willing to make um, these self ascriptions when you have a certain kind of conscious belief. But I missed that as an option. So this. This is an area, I think, in which the um, epistemology and the metaphysics and ways of integrating them, um, and also integrating them in ways that um, still respect a metaphysics first view of psychological concepts. Um, I think various possibilities have opened up in the last 25 years that were not, not available at the time. Um, I should say something about conceptual redeployment. That is something which I really have completely changed my view. <laughs> it's, it's, um, uh, so I, I talked about conceptual redeployment in, um, in the symposium with Tyler Burge and also in the book. Um, and I, I changed my mind about it. I changed my mind about it. And, um, I'm not the only person to have changed my mind about it. In fact, if you look at the literature on this, there's actually been a certain kind of convergence. Both Tyler Burge and Dave Chalmers have also written independently on these topics. My my own contribution on this is in the um, 
in the first trip for David Kaplan. I think the book book is called Themes Themes from Kaplan, something like that. Um, uh, and I was I was slightly amused actually, um, just looking at this very quickly this morning before we had this Zoom session. Um, I looked at what I said in 1995 in the symposium with Tyler Burge, and you know, people say that there's always something goes wrong in a philosopher's argument when they use the word surely. <laughs> Surely this or surely that. But people normally put that in where they think um, something is obvious, but they haven't got, got an argument. Um, and I noticed I had used the word surely in combination with saying something I now think is, is false. Um, here's, here's what I missed. And I think if you look at um, both Burge on this and their Chalmers, we independently all reached this same conclusion. Um, uh, one of the reasons people and I think probably the most basic reason that people talk about redeployment of a concept um, when you're making an attribution of a belief or mental state to somebody else um, is that there seems to be this very, very close connection between the, um, the outright assertion, it's raining, and the attribution, Lev believes it's raining. Um, there seems to be very, very close connection between them. Um, the predictive concept raining, which is presumably true or false of the time, and um, the concept that's employ employed in attributing the belief to Lev. And um, as Davidson and others pointed out two years ago, um, it isn't immediately clear on the Fregean view how that can be the case, because on the classical Fregean view, there's a certain sense of it's raining, a concept true or false of time, when it's embedded in the attribution Lev believes that it's raining, this has to be the sense of a sense. Um, and you seem to have to have an infinite hierarchy because you can say that Chris believes that Lev believes it's raining, you have to have a sense of a sense. Um, and uh, how is this infinite hierarchy generated, sense, senses of senses, because there's no root from reference to sense. Um, so, um, there is an answer to this question. There's an answer to this question. I, um, Davidson missed it in his earlier work. Um, other people who talked about redeployment also, also missed it, I think I did know. And um, there's such a thing as a canonical sense of a sense. There's such a thing as a canonical sense of a sense. Um, and there's ways of um, developing that account. A lot, um, a lot depends on what your positive theory of, of sense is. But if you look at the um, my paper in the Kaplan volume, and I think I think Dave Chalmers wrote it up somewhere subsequently to that. Um, uh, what you have to do is to give an account of what a sense is, what is to grasp a sense, and then explain how um, there's a very special way available to you if you grasp that sense of thinking about that sense. Um, and you can do this in terms of the true conditional evidential theories. Um, uh, but we we actually do it all the time. We actually do it all the time. There's there's such a thing as a canonical sense of a sense, um, a canonical sense of a sense, where you so you can respect the Fregean hierarchy without attributing these mysterious infinite powers to us of generating a sense of a sense which is special in some way, um, but isn't determined by a rule. I think you can you can give the rule and if you give it in terms of some kind of understanding conditions or um, I think can be given. Um, so the claim there, um, the basic issues there have to do with um, sense and senses of sense. Um, the, the question, um, as I said, I, I abandoned the redeployment claim anyway. The, the question there is very much about linguistic phenomena, um, which I don't think are quite um, a, a fundamental in this area. But I would like to talk a little bit about the, um, the actual example that's, that's given there. Um, so the example that's I mean, so somebody um, speaking of herself, Mary says, I feel bad. And then speaking of John, uh, Mary says, John says, I feel bad. And that's done in, um, it, that's a, a form of um, a direct reported speech, as quite correctly described there in the question. Um, in, in the case in which um, I, Hear Lev say, Lev says, I'm hungry. Um, the question of what I understand when I hear him 
say that. Um, needs, according to me, um, to make absolutely essential use of a certain distinction. And that's the distinction between employing a mode of presentation and referring to a mode of presentation. Seems to be employing and referring to. So um, when Lev says, I'm hungry, obviously, why, um, in knowing what he's saying, I don't um, know I'm hungry. What I know is that Lev is employing the first person mode of presentation. So when I think about what Lev is saying, I refer to the first person mode of presentation. I don't use it. I refer to the first person mode of presentation um, as used by Lev and say of um, say of the first person mode of presentation as used by Lev that he's having the thought under that mode of presentation that he's that he's hungry. This is not a complicated distinction. So as I said in lots of other material, um, uh, the same applies to um, now the present tense way of thinking. So um, I can know that um, in 1804, Napoleon may have thought um, now is a good time to invade wherever he's thinking of invading, let's say England. Or something. Um, now, now is a good time to invade England. Now, I can know what he was thinking. Maybe I read that in his diary. Um, of course, my knowledge isn't now as used by me. Napoleon wasn't thinking that now in 2023 is a good time to invade England. I don't use the present tense way of thinking in characterizing Napoleon's thought or his utterance. Um, rather, I refer to it. So what I need to do to understand Napoleon's utterance is to know that it, it's one that used the present tense mode of presentation and I should also know the time which is used if I'm really going to understand what he's saying. Um, so the distinction between using a mode of presentation and referring to it as the mode of presentation it is, is really crucial. And we use it all the time. I, I, here, now, you know, people in Sydney, Australia say it's raining here. Um, of course, I, what I need to do is know that they're using the, the here way of thinking, but they're using it um, to refer to the place they're at, not, not the place um, I'm at or the place, the place you're at. Um, so in that particular case, in the case of I and now and here, um, redeployment, even for linguistic case, wouldn't work anyway. And what you need to use is the distinction between um, uh, using a mode of presentation and referring to it in all of these cases of attributing attitudes and sayings to others, and indeed understanding other people in general. Um, uh, we're, we're often not um, using the modes of presentation that they themselves use in thinking. We're, we're referring to them as the as the types they they actually are. Um, so that's what I've got to offer about on that um, that second question. Anybody want to come back or pursue that? Pursue that further. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. I have two clarifying questions, but I need a little time to formulate them. So if it's possible, I would like to uh, ask this question just a little bit later, okay? Okay, sure, yeah. Okay, so let's... Um... Yeah, wait a, wait a minute, please. I also have a question. Uh, so uh, I just would like to understand it better. Is what you said about sense of a sense related to the Rudolf Carnap's argument and his meaning and necessity against Frege's sense and reference, that is, Zin and Bedotten, or sense and nominatum, as Carnap puts it, distinction? In a natural uh, sense, is an object, it could and should be named. That name has its own sense, which is another object, and so on. And if I remember correctly, Carnap claims that this situation is a kind of ill-found and progress. Uh, is it? Yes, that's, that is right. Yeah, that's that's correct. He does say that. Um, Consider just from the point of view, sep separating out um, names of senses from them, just doing it all in terms of the realm of senses. There's a sense, sense of a sense, a sense of a sense of a sense, and so forth, all the way up the hierarchy. And then if this isn't generated by a principle, because you know, in general, reference does not determine sense, um, if it isn't generated by a principle, then as Davidson quite rightly says in one of his articles, um, 
you haven't got a finite basis of language understanding. We we understand arbitrary embeddings of propositional attitudes. We understand that Chris believes that P, we understand Lev believes that Chris believes that P, we understand that um, Artem believes that Chris believes that Lev believes that P and so forth. Um, so we, we can go up any level of the hierarchy we like and we still understand it. Um, and so if the hierarchy of senses, senses, senses and so forth um, isn't generated by a principle, um, then we've, we haven't done the most basic thing we need to do in explaining language understanding, because, um, because uh, we need to say how that um, hierarchy is generated. If you can give the principle that generates the hierarchy, if you can explain where there's such a thing as a canonical sense of a sense, that for each sense, there's a special sense that involves um, thinking of this sense as the sense it is. Of course, that has to be done substantively. But if you can do that, if you can do that, um, then the Davidson objection is answered. There's no need to speak of redeployment because what's going on in finitely based language understanding is that you just apply that, you just apply that principle. You just move to the canonical sense of a sense in understanding all of those um, iterations, of, um, wherever high you go. So. Um, so yes, I mean, um, Carnap's um, objection shows that a certain constraint has to be met. What he didn't show was that the, the constraint couldn't be fulfilled. Um, and if you look at the various approaches in, in Burge and in my stuff and in Dave Charm's later stuff, um, it, you, you can give a good account of um, why for each sense, there's a special um, sense of that sense, a canonical sense of that sense. So that's very different. You know, there's no such thing as the, the canonical mode of presentation of me or my wristwatch or of Moscow. Um, uh, you know, it's a, a, but a sense is a different kind of thing. And if you relate it to understanding in various ways, um, um, then you get a good account of going. Your account will depend on your favored, favored treatment of sense in general. Your favorite treatment of sense has got to be such that using those resources, you can explain why for each sense, there's a canonical sense of a sense. Whereas for each ordinary object, a physical object or event, there's no such thing as the, the canonical sense of it. Um, so yeah, so Carnot was right to identify the problem. But he didn't didn't show it couldn't be solved, and I think it can be solved. And the same same goes for Davidson. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You need there, you need some technical details on that. There's some in in my paper in the Kaplan volume. Oh, uh, but as soon as you start thinking about whatever approach to sense you favor becomes clear that you can do things for a sense that you can't do for other objects here, right? Yeah. So should we, should we move on to the third question? That's Artem's. Um, yeah. Artem, would you, I, I don't want to read, this is uh, two, two and a bit pages there, question. Would you like to sort of summarize the question and, I will then yeah, um, I have to apologize for um, being a bit, uh, you know, lengthy and uh, maybe a no bit. No problem. I like that. I just didn't want to read it like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, basically, uh, essentially, it is uh, uh, a continuation of the line of arguments, uh, line of questioning I uh, started at um, uh, Professor Peacock's talk uh, at uh, UNLTCon. Uh, the question is about who, how should I summarize it? Um, well, uh, essentially, uh, it's about um, moral realism and uh, about uh, uh, whether uh, Professor Peacock's position. Uh, Mm. Mm. It escapes me. Um, whether it uh, turns out to be, whether this position uh, uh, turns out to be a position that uh, Oh, well, let me look in, into my own text, maybe. Let's look maybe, at, yeah, let's look at, let me pull out a few sentences. Um, yeah, maybe it'll help me. 
Yeah. Um, so one, one, one question you raised, which is a very important question, which is about the, the epistemic status of tacit knowledge or implicit knowledge of various yeah. principles. Um, yeah. And, um, you, you, you raised the question, do these, do these have to be known or not? Um, uh, if they do have to be known, then you know, I haven't solved the problem. Um, what, what, how generally should we conceive of implicit knowledge, either in the arithmetical case or the moral case? So I said that you had um, the, the understand the person who understands a discourse about natural numbers or who understands moral discourse had tacit knowledge of certain principles, and that tacit knowledge was drawn upon in evaluating moral propositions. Um, and that gave you a way in which you could integrate metaphysics, metaphysics and epistemology, actually, in a metaphysics first way, because in effect, the tacitly known principles. Give you the give you the metaphysics of the the domain. I say that both for natural number case and the and the moral case, and I would say it from necessity case too. Metaphysical. Insist. Is that is that a fair summary of your? Yeah, yeah. And uh, my worry was uh, that without a justification uh, for uh, for the claim that uh, the understanding of those principles is actually knowledge that um, there is something that grounds it in the world, however you would conceive the world in this case, there are problems about this, of course. Um, so without having that, we will uh, get something like um, frictionless spinning uh, in the void, to use the phrase of uh, yeah. John McDowell. Mm, so uh, there will be this uh, nice little discourse, uh, nice little domain of ours with rules uh, which we understand and apply, and those rules will provide some traction within uh, this domain. But uh, the question is, <clears throat> how this domain itself is related to the world and uh, if there is no way in which we can uh, ground it sort of to root it uh, into the world uh, then the worry is that uh, this uh, that this isn't a realism at all after all yeah. so like uh, for example the uh, example i used is uh, if we have a um, set of rules about um, discourse a set of rules of discourse about say fairies uh, and it is uh, an exhaustive set of rules and uh, the discourse uh, about fairies it gives uh, um, the propositions of the these discourse uh, uh, proper semantic content and uh, uh, establishable truth conditions then it seems that uh, on uh, professor peacock's view that um, uh, we should say that uh, we are realist about fairies uh, in this um, case, but that doesn't seem to be uh, a view right. worth uh, a name of realism. So, yeah, okay, good, excellent uh, question. Um, though on Carnap's view, actually, it would be an internal question and there'll be fairies, but um, yeah. anyway. Of course. That's for Carla, not for me. So it's still a question. So let me say something that may sound initially paradoxical. Um, uh, tacit knowledge isn't really knowledge. Okay. <laughs> so let's let's take um, and doesn't require justification in quite the same way, but it does involve a connection with the world. Let's let's take a let's take another case where I think we understand matters much more clearly. So take take Chomsky and Chomsky and tacit knowledge of a grammar for your language. Um, uh, Chomsky has long argued, and I think he'd made, you know, we don't think anybody's ever <laughs> satisfactorily refuted his arguments that you need some notion of tacit knowledge of a grammar to explain grammatical competence. Um, ordinary people um, don't conceptualize these grammatical categories at all. They have quite complicated rules to do with binding, formation of the past tense, formation of relative clauses. Um, and it's hard to discover um, explicitly what these laws are. That's why linguistics is a hard subject sometimes and linguists disagree. Um, so it, it isn't right to say that um, people ordinarily know, know these grammatical rules, um, but still you're quite right that um, not just any old state of so-called tacit knowledge is really going to sustain actual 
knowledge of which ordinary knowledge of which sentences are grammatical and which aren't. You know, you may be mis may mistaken, and all kinds of errors are possible. So the question arises of um, what's the distinction between the good cases and the bad cases, the good cases and the bad cases in respect of this tacit or implicit um, implicit knowledge or, or cognizing, as I think Chomsky says at one point in one of his writings. Um, and I, I think at that point, the correct answer is, is a pure reliabilist account, a pure reliabilist account. Um, so when children come to um, learn their first language and you know there's all kinds of inductive biases, all kinds of um, innate components plausibly, um, uh, but they they come to oh, sorry somebody what else needs to be omitted yeah um there's all kinds of um mechanisms by which the the tacit knowledge that they end up possessing um is actually reliable it's actually reliable that this is the grammatical rule um, rather than something else being the grammatical rule um and reliability there um let's just take the empirical case of linguistics at the moment, um, meets, meets your condition, meets your desideratum, um, because there'll be a connection with reality, okay? It will have the, um, these mechanisms, these long evolutionary mechanisms that produce this, this innateness and these, these biases in linguistic learning um, means that the child latches on to what are in fact the correct grammatical, grammatical rules, even though the child can't formulate it, even though there's no notion of justification there. Um, and so in some sense, the, um, the states of tacit knowledge that the, the child who acquires the language knows the syntax and the semantics, um, the states they're in um, are reliable indicators about linguistic reality itself, that which are the, you know, which are the um, well-formed senses of the language and which aren't. Okay. That case is interesting because it's an empirical proposition. It's an empirical proposition, which are the the correct grammatical rules for um, a given given natural language. It's not it's not an a priori matter. Um, but I think the same kind of account, a purely reliableist account, needs to be given <clears throat> of the natural number case or the necessity case. Um, so I my let's take the case of I would bore you to death on natural numbers. So let's let's take the case of metaphysical necessity. Um, my view is that the grasp of the concept of metaphysical necessity involves tacit knowledge of certain principles that um, genuinely constrain possibility. A, a genuine possibility um, has, is constrained by certain, certain principles. If we violate those principles, we don't have a genuine possibility. Um, so what's, what's, tacitly, um, what's tacitly known when somebody really understands or grasps the notion of metaphysical necessity? Are certain principles that are in fact constitutive of um, of metaphysical necessity. Um, and now the question arises: um, how how are these um, how are these properly connected with with modal reality itself? Or to put it less contentiously, how are they properly connected with something's really being this necessity, really being constitutive or not? And the my my claim would be that. Um, uh, there's going to be some, some kind of selection mechanism, just as there is in the natural language case. When somebody's, um, if somebody's getting it wrong in the case of, let's just take the case of linguistic understanding. If somebody's um, getting it wrong and not, not got the right principles um, that are genuinely constitutive um, of metaphysical necessity, um, uh, of course, people can make mistakes. People have made mistakes about metaphysical necessity itself. But there'll be some some mechanism or other that, in good cases, eventually selects for those principles that are in fact constitutive. And if you use those that are not constitutive, you'll you'll go wrong in various cases, and um, eventually, one way or another. So, I think there's important respect in which your question is very good and absolutely targets something that needs to be said. But you have to connect these states of um, tacit knowledge with the reality they're about in some way or other. Um, not, not causal in the case of natural numbers. Um, it is causal in the Chomsky case. It is causal in the case of knowing the, having tacit knowledge of the syntactic rules of your natural language. Um, so it's a good question, important one, needs answering. But I think the status of tacit knowledge, precisely because it's not really 
um, knowledge in the sense that needs justification or other conditions on something's being knowledge in the case of genuine knowledge, um, they, they don't apply there. But nonetheless, it doesn't mean that the connection with reality is completely severed. Though you're, you're quite right. You need to have a good account of why the subject has this tacit, um, this to put it neutrally, this tacit proposition rather than another. And why it is that um, in good cases, these can lead to ordinary knowledge of arithmetical truths or propositions, yeah. So yeah, I, I, accept, I accept the challenge and it needs, it needs to be met. I think that's my immediate reaction on the way to meet it. And I think um, the, the Chomsky case gives a certain kind of model, model for it, um, but it, it needs further thought. And it's, a good, it's a good topic, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, my follow-up is uh, uh, I'm familiar with uh, uh, some of the modern developments in sort of moral realist area with Schaefer Landau's and uh, um, uh, um, Terence Cuneo's uh, moral fixed points uh, framework. Yeah. Uh, like conceptual moral truths. Yeah. Uh, would this uh, i was listening at the beginning of your today's talk um, about your um, metaphysics first view and is uh, what you were saying uh, compatible with basically what they are saying because it seems yeah. to me that uh, basically they say that uh, the uh, it seems to me that they take the third option that you um, exclude uh, that is, they say that uh, there, in some cases, there are um, what makes. It's not about truth makers. In some cases, it's about, in some cases, uh, not facts. It is not the case that facts are truth makers, but it is the case that truths are fact makers. Yes. So and so they say that in case of conceptual truths. Um, particularly in case of moral truths. Uh, moral truths are fact makers. Uh, and uh, there is some, I think, uh, um, similarity to your general view in that uh, they take the conceptual route uh, into the problem of uh, moral realism. But uh, what do you think in general? Does it violate your uh, exclusion of this third way, or is it just, um, is it compatible with what you said? Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So this is a very interesting, important question. Um, um, and the position you identified, the so-called fixed point thing, there, there are analogs of that in, in logic too, so in the philosophy of logic. So if you think of um, some people, and indeed I myself said this very long time ago, um, I don't now agree with it. So, um, some people take the view of um, uh, the sense of logical constants that you hold have certain principles um, that somehow determine their sense. They're analogous to the fixed points in the moral thing. And then even if you want to say that a, um, a logical constant refers to a truth function, the truth function has to be one that respects, makes these principles always truth preserving. And so these principles would then have a kind of fixed point role analogous to the role that um, Schaefer, Lando, and so forth have in, in the moral case. Um, uh, so yeah, that's it's it's a position that arises in various areas. Um, for each of these areas, there's a a substantive question. Um, I'm sorry, but I, sh I should mention Carnap there as well, of course, because you know the the so-called rules of language and the Carnap position play something like that role. I mean, he doesn't have semantic values in quite the same way, but still, they they have a certain um, a certain role that's similar. Um, in some of the in the in the moral case, I'm I'm very skeptical that they have the status that um, that uh, uh, Schaefer Lando and others say they do. I um, I I suspect a lot of these so um, some of the fixed point things anyway have a further rationale that they have a, a more fundamental rationale in terms of, of moral thought. But let's suppose they don't. Let's suppose that um, it, it's as you describe, as they describe it. Um, uh, then, then yeah, I think um, 
I think uh, we would be in the territory of a no priority view, not, not the third view, but the, the second of the views. That would be a no priority view, I think. Um, and it would be as, as entitled to the label of realism as secondary quality views of, of um, colors, which is, you know, it's iffy. It's, it's certainly very different from the metaphysics, from the metaphysics first view. Um, so yeah, if you, if you write into, um, if you write into the very account of what determines um, or what individuates a certain, um, a certain sense that certain principles have to be accepted for it, they're not consequential, but they're just written in primitively. Um, then yeah, you're going to end up with a no priority view. That is that is true. Um, in the case of logic, I um, one of the reasons I came to reject that very early view, um, and it's a view that's in, um, it's also in some ways, it's a view in a study of concepts too in the 1992 book, you know, where I said certain logical principles are primitively compelling. And then the truth, uh, the truth function that's referred to by or or not or whatnot is, um, is the one that makes these principles always truth preserving. One of the reasons I came to reject that view um, is that the, and this is a question whether this applies in the moral case too, is that although these principles are certainly compelling, um, they're also rationally held on the basis of understanding. It's one of the most interesting rationalist notions that needs a lot of further investigation. So that you you accept these logical principles, and I think actually in the case of some of the moral principles too, um, um, your acceptance of them isn't just sort of stipulated to be written in. It's not, um, uh, it's rather, it's something that's rationally reached on the basis of your understanding. And um, e I think that even in the case of conjunction elimination, even in the case of the, the rule that from A and B, you can infer A, um, you know, if, Anything in logic is primitive and compelling. That's that's one of them. Um, but even that one is, it's you hold it rationally because of your understanding of what and means. Um, and it's not just stipulatively written into that. It's that um, it's got some deeper understanding that um, A and B is true just in case both A and B is true. Um, so it, seem, it seems to be answerable to some prior understanding. And um, if somebody questions it, you appeal back to initial understanding. Same issue would apply in the moral case, but I, I agree with you conditionally. If, if some of these principles actually have to be written into the nature of the sense itself, the grasp of the sense and the relation in which you have to stand to something in order for it to be the reference, if that's sort of written in as principle, then it would be a no priority case rather than the metaphysics first case, yes. I agree. So yeah, it's a good, good and important, important distinction. So one of the interesting, I mean, I haven't talked about it in detail so much, but um, uh, if you look at some developmental psychologists are particularly prone to this. They they tend to say things um, like um, that the child has grasped the first person um, concept when, and then they talk about its use in various first person descriptions and so forth. Um, that they they relate it to. Um, conceptual capacities involving the first person, um, rather than relating it to um, uh, a connection between first person thought and the much more primitive states of organisms that don't even have the first person. So for example, I would say that one of the most important things about grasp of the first person has nothing to do with its linguistic expression or use in other contexts in the first person, but the fact that um, the child is other things equal, willing to judge um, there's a toy in front of me, just in case there's a toy given in perception in front of the here, the here, the, the origin of the um, content of the perceptual state. And, and so that's anchoring grasp of the first person um, in these metaphysically prior um, representational states. Um, so it's always a good question. It's always a good question to ask about any given domain, the question precisely you're asking. Um, is it or is it not the case? There are certain um, principles that are sort of written in uh, to the account of grasp of sense that would preclude a metaphysics first view and um, should always look very carefully. <laughs> it's, um, you know, maybe surprises in this area. Sometimes you can do more with the metaphysics first than you might have expected. 
Sometimes in other cases, um, it may be there's subtle and interesting ways in which the concepts themselves are involved in, in the metaphysics. So yeah, it's always epistemically an open question. It's a good question to think about, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, uh, me myself, I'm much more sympathetic towards metaphysics view, metaphysics first view, uh, in case of metaphysics of morality. But uh, I'm just not yet sure that we can afford it, so to speak. Yeah, no, uh, it's a substantive yeah. thing. Yeah, this work. Uh, Lev, can I ask uh, one more quick follow up? Yes, sure. Uh, so, uh, given that you um, generally agree with uh, what I said that uh, we need some kind of further story of uh, how we um, come to acquire uh, those sets of uh, intrinsic uh, principles that we understand and uh, tacit knowledge of which we have. Um, and uh, uh, I do agree that in case of say mathematics or in case of modality, um, there are uh, at first sight, at least, uh, prima facie, um, uh, um, there are some such stories or potential stories available for us uh, to as to how um, we might, as a species, come to acquire uh, understanding of those principles. Do you agree that uh, it is uh, quite? Uh, it is a bit more problematic in case of morality to tell such a story, okay. that yep. it is uh, much less evident how you might uh, plausibly uh, do that. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, selection pressures will not get you to morality, as everybody knows. They'll get you to something different. They'll get you to whatever is, <laughs> whatever is adaptive. And it's sometimes... Um, highly non-adaptive to do the, the genuinely moral thing. Um, and that holds for species as well as individuals. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a form of thought um, uh, that um, whose mastery is, is not to be explained purely by selection pressures. That, that is true. That's true, yeah. But I, I agree about that, yeah. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a question, very short question here from um, Dimitri, I think is not, not on the call, right? Um, yes, he's absent. Yep. yep. Uh, so the question was just, how do you draw the line between the contribution of semantics, the contribution of psychology to epistemology um sometimes it gets the impression that the menth is in the field of semantics short question but um important one um i think if you take literally the idea that semantics is just the association of of meanings with the words or the concepts with the words, then um, uh, there's going to be certain epistemological phenomena that are, that are tied to the identity of the concept itself. Um, uh, so that's, that's certainly true of the logical cases we were just thinking about. It's certainly true of um, the Let's take the first person, um, since we've been talking about it. Um, you know, the semantics of the first person will just say, if you're doing it in Fregean terms, that, that I in English expresses the first, ter first person way of thinking as used by the utterer. Um, and then all the questions about the, the norms and the epistemology of first person knowledge um, will be traceable back to the the nature of the the mode of presentation, nature of the way of thinking. So why is it that perceptual experience can give me a reason for thinking there's a computer in front of me, but doesn't necessarily give me a reason for thinking there's a computer in front of Christopher Peacock because I may be suffering from amnesia or whatnot. 
Um, so all of those, those kinds of epistemological phenomena, what gives a reason for what, what justifies what, some of that will be traceable back to the, um, the nature of the, the concept or the sense involved. And that, you know, it's wrong to say that semantics. Um, somebody may say, well, oh, this is just an illusion, Chris. You know, if you look at this carefully, you haven't really got a genuine notion of sense here. Everything traces back to linguistic convention if you look carefully enough. Um, so if somebody says that, I'm all ears, I will listen. I'm very skeptical, but you know, if, they, if that can be shown, that fair enough. But that's that's a distinction in the first instance. I mean, it's not a distinction between what can be um, epistemological phenomena that depend on the nature of the concept expressed as opposed to the just the linguistic association of the expression with the concept. That's um, I'm not sure many epistemological phenomena can be traced back just to semantics in that sense at all. I'm sorry we don't have the questioner with us, so we... Um, further clarification is not going to be <laughs> elicited on this particular occasion. Um, uh, there's also, part of the question is also about the contribution of, of psychology. And um, uh, I do think it's absolutely true that, you know, recent very interesting developments in psychology of various domains have to be reconciled with a plausible epistemology. That, that is true. Um, but that's that's not semantics. I mean, that's that's a different topic. So anyway, I'm sorry, we can't really pursue that further without knowing what's in the mind of the, the questioner. Um, let's go back to the last question is Lev's question. Lev, maybe you'd like to articulate it for us. Okay, so <clears throat> so my question is about the linking thesis. Uh, I I say that the linking thesis relies on epistemically individuated concepts, that is on knowledge, and but but. We all understand that typically we do not have knowledge. We have knowledge claims and knowledge claims are considered as knowledge, but still it can be repelled in the context of further experience. Like if I believe that it is raining outside, then I go out to check it and it's not raining. So, uh, I should repel my knowledge claim that it is raining uh, and so on. So thus relying on knowledge claims instead of knowledge itself undermine or weaken the linking thesis. So that's my first question. Yeah, okay. So the linking thesis was about um, epistemically individuating concepts. So my, my idea was, um, that you know, Frege classically said that um, a sense A and a sense B are distinct if you could rationally judge some content containing A without rationally judging the corresponding content containing B. So you judge the morning star as the morning star without necessarily judging the morning star as the evening star. You can rationally judge there's a computer in front of me without rationally judging there's a computer in front of Christopher Peacock. So that was all in terms of judgment. Um, and that, incidentally, to go back to one of the earlier things I was talking about, um, this is one of the points at which there's, you know, this obviously immediate gap in Frege's thought, because senses are individuated in terms of what you can rationally judge, but what you're judging is something in the third realm. So, you know, we have, <laughs> the question is, this third realm was supposed to be autonomous, distinct from the realm of the mental and the realm of the physical. Yeah, they're getting characterized in terms of possibility of judgment, which is very strange unless you relate sense more closely to what thinkers are actually doing with them. Um, but so I'm digressing. To get back onto the main freeway. Um, yeah, so the idea of epistemic individuation of concepts was that it wouldn't, it would be perfectly okay also to say that um a sense A and a sense B um are distinct if if and only if you could know something containing A without knowing something, the corresponding thing containing B. So I can know there's a computer in front of me without knowing there's a computer in front of Christopher Peacock. Um, and so um, 
I took that to be significant in various ways. It connects judgment and knowledge in various ways. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that everything is knowable. It doesn't mean that um, if you take something like the continuum hypothesis, um, yes, yeah, built up from various other concepts, you know, con containing concepts of one-to-one -one mapping, containing the concepts of natural numbers, containing you know the next cardinal up and so forth. Um, and each of those concepts from which it's built up would be individuated in um, by the Fregean criterion, but it wouldn't follow you necessarily know, you know, um, you're in a position to know any proposition that could be formed using those concepts. And, and nor would Frege say that. Frege was a realist, didn't think everything that was true was provable or anything like that. Um, so that's the issue. But then you wanted to say something much more specific about the continuum hypothesis, which I think is interesting. Yeah, do you, do you want to just formulate that for? Yes. So, so uh, I'd like to continue our discussion, which took yeah. place at your analytic on, and we discussed Kurt Gödel and his uh, his realism, or rather, kind of Platonism, if you like, and his stance on continuum hypothesis. So. Uh, uh, Kurt Gödel uh, hold it that continuum hypothesis is true in the first place, but later he uh, accepted that it is false. He claimed that it is false. So uh, the question is, did he, according to the linking thesis and your whole conception, know that continuum hypothesis is true in the first place? And if so, isn't such a conception of knowledge diverged from the traditional one as justified through belief? Because, well, well, I, well, yes, it should be noted that you extend the traditional uh, definition of knowledge with some further uh, requirements like informational conditions and so on, at least in your being known. And, uh, and 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 in fact, I suppose that probably one would say that Gödel did not know that continuum hypothesis is true, and he believed that it is true. But did he know later that continuum hypothesis is false? Because, well, when it comes to continuum hypothesis, uh, I personally don't know how to decide the truth value of continuum hypothesis, at least nowadays. That is, there are lots of arguments in favor of yeah. continuum hypothesis and lots of arguments against it. Right. So one can develop that theory beyond, say, thermal of Rankin or thermal of uh, uh, the axiom of choice, at least in two different ways. One with continuum hypothesis as truth, and one another with continuum hypothesis as falsehood. So does any of this? To ways constitute knowledge of continuum hypothesis. Yeah, so the linking thesis is not a theory of knowledge. Okay, the linking thesis okay. was just linking conceptual mastery um, and the individuation of a concept with a condition that mentions knowledge. It didn't say what knowledge is. It just says that uh, instead of using the Fregean criterion for rationally judge F A without rationally judging F B. It, it says you could you could know FA without knowing FB. Okay, so it, it's not a positive theory of knowledge at all. It simply uses the notion of knowledge and connects it, it links it. That's why I call it linking, linking thesis. Um, but still, yeah, about the continuum hypothesis. Um, so it is it is an extremely interesting question. So um I think the the deepest issue here, and this is the way that very, very good set theorists think about the matter. The, the really interesting question here is whether you can formulate, find new conditions on being a set that go beyond the iterative connect, conception, for example, that turn out to settle the continuum hypothesis. I mean, suppose you can do that and they're really compelling. People have tried the so-called reflection principles. You know, if something holds for the whole universe of sets, then it must hold for some initial segment up the hierarchy when the quantifiers are restricted. A lot of people have thought about reflection principles like that, which have a certain intuitively uh, compelling, they can be as compelling as the hierarchical conception in various ways. Um, 
But to the best of my knowledge, nothing that's been proposed so far in this area has yet settled the question of the continuum hypothesis. But my own view is that we, we, we genuinely don't know. Um, if, if in fact there really is, there really is nothing in our intuitive conception that anybody could discover that will really settle either way, then there are just various different conceptions of the universe of sets. There's a conception in which the continuum hypothesis holds, a conception which doesn't, so forth. Um, and in that case, I think it is right to say that these are just alternative precisifications of the notion of set. I think the most interesting case conceptually and philosophically is the case where there is something not yet known to us that um, which if articulated, we would recognize as compelling as certain kinds of reflection principles or as compelling um, as um, the iterative conception or as compelling as the existence of extremely large cardinals. Um, if there's something as compelling as that, um, that settles the question, um, then I would think it would be right to say that um, the continuum hypothesis accepting it is, is not a precisification, it's, it's a discovery, it's a discovery about um, hitherto hidden features of the notion of um, a set. So in other realms of thought that are not nearly as difficult technically as set theory, um, there are cases in which we come to accept new principles um, on the basis of our original conception, even though our original conception was not sufficiently articulated. So um, in moral philosophy, for example, um, uh, the people have sometimes talked about the ideal of authenticity, right? It's, if you, um, it's not completely clear that there's any ideal of authenticity or it's articulated in, certainly in Greek literature, it's not clear it's, um, uh, um, it's not clear at all it's in, in pre-romantic literature. It's not clear that it's in Corneille or Racine, um, but it's certainly in 19th century literature. Um, and it's an ideal, it's an ideal of being authentic. It's a moral ideal in certain respects. Um, and um, I think one could articulate something about morality, about certain kind of openness and genuineness that's um, ideal that um, is, is required by morality, but hadn't previously been articulated. And if, if, if that's correct, I'm not saying it isn't so, but if, it, if it's correct, then one would say in these cases that adding the ideal of authenticity to um, moral interpersonal relations isn't, isn't just a stipulation, isn't just a refinement, isn't just a precisification. It's, um, it's an advance in moral thought. It's, it's sort of genuine discovery. This is a value that we hadn't previously articulated. In the case of environmental ethics, it's it's obviously true. I mean, though it's much easier to get there that the environment should be considered um, morally as it rules. So, um, so yeah, I um, I don't know. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody else knows. But I, I would very sharply distinguish between the cases in which this is settled. The the CH is settled by some hitherto undiscovered, very compelling characterization of the universe of sets, and the case in which it's just a precisification, a stipulation. What I do think, one of the reasons I think Gödel changed his mind, um, I've, I've no idea, Gödel was a very complicated person. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I think once you begin to think in what, what actually are in, in many ways actually Gödelian terms that we may not have yet fully articulated features of our understanding, um, then um, then you would become much more cautious about pronouncing on the pronouncing on the truth value of the thing. I think um, I, I just make that that cautious statement. But I think the principal distinction, in principle distinction between precisification and the discovery we have not yet been able to to make. I think that's that's a distinction we should we should apply everywhere. Yeah, it's not restricted to set theory. It's a, a feature of understanding in general. It's a it's one of the ideas in, in rationalism that I think is right. It's a rationalist idea that somehow there's some, something about our understanding that may have a structure that's not immediately obvious to us and takes, takes thought to, to identify. Okay, thank you. Okay, so does anybody want to come back on the, the first person and consciousness? We bracketed that and- um, Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I only have one question left because while I was formulating the first, I figured out the answer to the second, so it's no longer relevant. So answering the very first question about the ontology of uh, the subject, you said about explanatory significance of mental states for actions, or subject actions. Well, the question is, do you think it's necessarily to determine subjects' mental states correctly in order to use them in explanations? Because if it is, it seems to me that we should not talk about explanatory significance of mental states in general, but about explanatory significance of correctly determining what mental states a subject has for well explaining her uh, actions but in that case i have a slight objection but it depends on your answer so what do you think is it necessarily or not so i think we you know we can often get it wrong but um i think what it's answerable to so suppose you suppose a very simple case you attribute to somebody a perceptual state they didn't in fact have okay you you, you assume that the person would have seen this person in that direction from them. And you try to use this in explanation of the later actions. It certainly turns out that they simply weren't attending to that direction at all. They were um, attending to something else. They never noticed the person was there. And so um, if, if you're wrong about what mental state someone is in, then you may well get wrong what future actions they perform. But I think you're aiming, you're aiming at correctness. I mean, you we, we often get it wrong, but you're aiming aiming to attribute those states that that will be explanatory of the later the later actions so i don't know if that helps go ahead yeah yeah okay i got it uh, but what about my well slight objection uh i agree that it's pretty common idea that we ascribe mental states to persons to make sense of their behavior but usually i think that these descriptions are made backwards what i mean is that first we see an action something that a person does and then we explain this action by uh, referring to some mental states that this subject supposedly had before prior making this action. Uh, and if explanation works, uh, that means that our description was correct. But what about cases when our explanation works? Well, I mean, explanation works, but our description, it's not correct. Um, we can imagine a case when uh, we say that a person made an action for one reason, but actually it made it for another reason. But explanation yeah. works, and um, person's behavior doesn't seem very strange to us. So we think that it was explained. So we are uh, we stay with our uh, description, and we think that yes, it's correct. But actually, in real case. It wasn't correct. Or we can imagine, for example, a very extravagant case or imagined scenario uh, well, with our super intelligent uh, neuroscientists, uh, we, which uh, that can uh, read humans' humans' minds. Well, so they can uh, identify and determine neural states as well as mental states. And uh, for example, they say that since neuroscientists say that uh, it was mental state A. Uh, the subject had, but we prior uh, identified this mental state as a mental state B, and our explanation worked. So uh, we think that our description was correct, but actually, believing in neuroscientists, we should uh, say that yes, this explanation wasn't correct, but um, description wasn't correct, but explanation worked. So in this case, I, it seems to me that we don't we don't need this correct uh, determination of mental states if explanations if our explanations work well. What? So what do you think about that? Yeah. So you say it worked, but you know there'd be counterfactuals. You know, if we've really got the wrong explanation, <laughs> um, we'll go wrong in various nearby circumstances. If the real explanation was something else, if we think somebody's motive was A rather than B. And we can certainly think of circumstances in which we got the wrong explanation. They'll do something different from um, what we'd expect. Um, but just to go back to the other things you said about doing this backwards, we see what people do and then attribute mental states on that basis. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people who think that, and I, I think something like this is right, that we we think other people are like me. Okay, we 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 put ourselves, we simulate the situation they're in. 
and think about what what we would believe or think or what emotions we'd have in those circumstances um and that's not working backwards at all we think about the circumstances they're in and there's those circumstances um we'd feel this we do this and then we predict how we'd act um using ourselves as models so I, th I think quite a few cases are like that I mean we don't always you know treat people as black boxes and work backwards from their actions we think about what's the situation they're in if I was in that situation of course there's you know uh lots of qualifications to that I know they have different moods they may have different values or whatnot but there's still a kind of baseline in which we use we use that model use use ourselves um as kind of simulation devices um for what uh what we do or feel or think in those circumstances so I don't think we I think it's um we sometimes do that and sometimes don't basically I think there's us um I think that the the perceptual states we attribute are answerable to explanations of people's future actions of course in combination with their emotions their appetites their desires and so forth um but then there's all sorts of ways sometimes we work backwards sometimes we work forwards if it's a very strange and difficult kind of person that we we know they're very different from us we may have to go backwards but in other cases where we think they're very similar to us we we don't need to do that we know it's just obvious in these circumstances this person would feel that way they would do so and so um so I think there's cases and cases but I think if you tried to separate the the correctness of attribution of perceptual content completely from explanations of people's future actions I think it would that would be implausible I think the basic role of I'm saying that I see something in this direction rather than that direction that I see it this far away rather than that far away um I think all has to do with it's all answerable to the actions that I would make if there was something desirable in this direction as opposed to that direction so forth that's the that's how it earns its explanatory keep I think yeah okay I got it thank you okay um I have some more questions, if I may. So, uh, first of all, the question about metaphysics primacy. Um, typically, intuitionism and constructivism are explained as views which start with epistemology, not metaphysics. Yeah. And also, Hilbert's formalism is explained in this way by Paul Benesaraf, uh, in fact, in his uh, mathematical truth. So. Is it still, according to you, the case of metaphysical primacy? Okay, so good question. Um, so, um, intuitionism in mathematics can be driven by two different kinds of motivation. So one kind of motivation um, that could drive it is um, simply the, the meaning first view um, that I mentioned, the thing that I said is incompatible with the, the primary thesis. You may say that um, all that's involved in understanding a certain mathematical concept is certain ways of coming to prove that it's instantiated, or if you like the consequent view, consequences of this holding or provable consequences of something like that if you believe something like that that's one way of getting to an account that's get one way of getting to an intuitionistic um understanding of mathematics because meaning just generally is given in terms of establishing conditions right um now if you take some people who are sympathetic to some intuitionistic accounts of mathematics when the, um Michael Dummett for instance is a much more complicated case because um he he never said reference was irrelevant to understanding. Um, uh, he, he's not a pure conceptual role theorist at all. Um, and in my view, um, I used to discuss this with him all the time, but we never came to agree. Um, it, it creates a certain kind of instability. So, um, uh, suppose, um, let's take, um, This is one of the sharpest cases. Let's take a universal quantification of the natural numbers. And in particular, um, uh, let's take um, 
the the girdle sentence that every natural number is not a, a girdle number of a proof of so and so the, the classical girdle sentence um now if you look at what intuitionists say about that and what Dummett says about it they say oh well the notion of proof is indefinitely extensible um this sentence is true because although we couldn't prove it in our original mathematical system um uh we can still accept a notion of proof under which we can count this as proved. <laughs> I, I, I say that's cheating. I say it's cheating. You're not allowed to say that. You can't just say it's well counted as proved. Um, you originally gave some rules for proof of universal quantification, and this thing we know is not provable by those means. Um, so you shouldn't accept it as proved. Um, on the other hand, you could, if you like, accept a different account of universal quantification, not one given in terms of proof conditions, but for example, let's say the commitments you accept when you accept every natural number is F, then you're committing yourself to zero being F, one is F and so forth. Fine, if you accept that commitment-based account, then indeed we have in the Gödel theorem a proof that every natural number is not the number of a Gödel proof of the, the Gödel sentence. Um, uh, so if, um, if you're an intuitionist who accepts that reference plays a fundamental role, and then you want to say things like that about the Gödel sentence, that it's legitimate to accept it as um, uh, something that's proved, um, I, I say that's an incoherent position. You're, you're accepting an account of, your official account of meaning means you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. It's you, um, you're not applying your own standards um, for, for meaning in the regional universally quantified sentence. Um, so, uh, I think um, intuitionism looks very, very strange from the point of view of the um, the primary thesis. If you've got, um, if it's supposed to be just a, essentially a pure conceptual view that meaning is explained simply in terms of proof and so forth, um, then the arguments um, against that position um, already come in. In fact, it's a position under which reference is playing their role. There's, there's lots of other problems with it as well. Um, if you're somebody who does think that uh, reference has a role to play in understanding, um, but then you take a stance on the Gödel sentence, I, I also think the position is, is objectionable. You've got a role of, of a reference there, but I, I have no conception of how the intuitionist will really satisfactorily and consistently with his own principles, um, say that it's okay to accept the Gödel sentence as proved by Gödel's proof. Um, as I say, it's it's just cheating. It, it, you you start off by saying the meaning of the universal quantification is given by methods of proving it. You have these initial methods, and you suddenly say, "Oh well, by the Gödel proof, here's a new method of proving it." Well, but it isn't. It, it's, it remains the case that that sentence cannot be established by the original means of proof. Um, and that point, people will say, "Well." notion of proof is indefinitely extensible we can extend it in a certain way i i object it's the intuitive notion of proof it's not an extension it's absolutely required it's compelled by your original understanding of universal quantification which is not given by a proof condition that the girdle proof shows that um the girdle sentence is true it's a proof of it it's a um it's not a stipulation or an extension or a precisification of notion of proof it's um and that, I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, I, if you actually look at Gödel's original philosophical motivations for trying to establish the theorem, he, he originally thought it's just an amazing insight. This is a mind in a different league from ours. He said it was intuitively obvious from the Ricard paradox that you should be able to um, establish something like his, his proof of um, incompleteness of any recursive accusation of arithmetic. Well, he has he had a mind of a quality, I'm afraid I don't have, but that was his in that was his original intuition that the will be in the nature of the case. Um, these statements, they say of themselves that they're not provable, but they must actually um, actually be provable. And, and, you know, using it. and indeed, you know, it's a completely intuitive, if you look at the way that the history of the subject developed, um, Tarski immediately, when he was presented with the Gödel's proof, yes, said, yeah, this also shows that truth is not definable in first order arithmetic, which is, which is true. You can't define the truth predicate itself. Otherwise you could do the Gödel argument um, within arithmetic itself. So yeah, I think these are very hard cases for the intuitionist. The intuitionist who isn't just a um, purely conceptual role theorist, uses the notion of reference, uses the notion of um, statements of universally quantified form, um, um, uh, 
having their truth value determined by the constituents. Um, I think the girdle phenomenon is a tremendous problem for them. I don't think there's an easy way of accommodating it. Just speaking of indefinite extensibility is, is sort of cheating. Just saying it's an acceptable method of proof is not really consistent with the original specification of meaning. And um, I don't know what they can say, really. If you, the, there's a, um, if you look at some of the arguments for intuitionism, you know, these arguments about manifestation that dumb it things that you can't give a response to undecidable circumstances, they're completely irrelevant at this point. You can give a, a completely, um, a completely good account, excuse me, um, I'll take it later. You can give a completely acceptable account of, um, uh, um, there's no difficulty in manifesting your grasp of understanding universal quantification. It's just an open-ended commitment. So you have this, when you believe that all natural numbers have got property F, then you're, you've got this commitment to zero having a property, one having a property, and that's, yeah, that's a manifestable commitment. Um, and it's clear that if that's the if the, there's a corresponding correctness condition for universal quantification, um, then the Gödel sentence is is required. You know, it, the, the Gödel sentence is um, shown to be true on that basic understanding. It's the, you know, the commitment you incur in uh, judging universal quantification is shown to be fulfilled by the Gödel proof if arithmetic is consistent. Um, so I regard the intuitionists as in a very, very difficult, unstable position at this point. They they, they can't respect their own constraints on um, on meaning, I think, um, and explain why they can't hold simultaneously that meaning of universal quantification is given by its proof conditions, and also hold that the um, you can sometimes prove universal quantification in a way that goes beyond those those proof conditions. So, it's not consistent, basically. Um, you're saying, I think the only way of accommodating it is for, um, is to admit, acknowledge um, that the universal quantifications, our understanding of it, um, goes beyond the proof conditions. The proof conditions are proving something of which we had some independent grasp. And that independent grasp is what we draw on in acknowledging that the Gödel proof proves something without changing the meaning, without doing a precisification or anything like that. Okay, uh, I guess, well, I guess that uh, the concept of indefinite extensibility probably can be tracked to Brouwer's conception of law-like sequence. And uh, when it comes to Gödel's theorem, uh, I'd say that Gödel's, Gödel shows how to construct Gödel, the Gödel sentence, uh, but it's what he shows is just a kind of a syntactic business. Uh, Gödel sentence is true because we interpret it in some particular way, and our interpretation depends on Gödel numbering. I I, do, I don't agree with that at all. I um the. We accept the Gödel sentence is true because what is proved is that if the arithmetic is consistent, is that every natural number is um, not a natural number that's the Gödel number of a proof of a certain sentence. Um, so you know it's, it's true because he's shown that every instance of the universal quantification is true. So that's you know the, that that intuitive argument uses the notion of truth. I mean that's that's what's so striking about the Gödel argument. Um, it also as a corollary, it shows that truth is not definable in terms of um, ordinary first order arithmetic notions, because otherwise you could do the argument within the um, within arithmetic itself. But I think it, it's not a further stipulation. If you look at what, what the Gödel sentence says is that every natural number is not a natural number of a, it's not the Gödel number of a certain kind of proof. And he's proved that if arithmetic is consistent. Um, so, it, it isn't a further stipulation. I mean, he's shown that every instance of the universal quantification is true, and that's all that's required for universal quantification to be true. Now, what is absolutely correct is that intuitive argument that seems wholly compelling essentially uses the notion of truth. You can't do it without the notion of truth. It, you can't do it just in terms of provability. But um, 
So the issue you raise, yes, yeah, what, what indefinite extensibility means. And um, I think it is true that um, I, I don't reject the notion of indefinite extensibility. I think it does have application in certain circumstances. I think our understanding of certain motions has this schematic element. Um, uh, I think our general notion of truth actually has this schematic element. I think, um, you know, we don't know what future concepts we're going to introduce. There may be new concepts that we don't currently grasp. Um, but if you ask, uh, is, is the nature of those concepts to be given in terms of their contribution to truth conditions for some general indefinitely extensible notion of truth? I'd say, yeah, I vote, I vote for that. Um, so I think we have a general schematic notion of um, a truth predicate um, whose extension depends on the semantic values of the various constituents of a proposition. That's a, and that's a schematic notion. We can't restrict it to just one class of concepts. So I think we do have schematic understanding, um, but I'm very, very skeptical that that schematic understanding can be reconciled with proof condition or interest in it to conceptions of meaning. It's um, uh, further argument for another time sometime, but that's, yeah, that, that's the issue to be addressed. Um, Okay, and my and then another question is about Frege, uh, which uh, so uh, I believe that Frege developed a conception about how a cognitive agent can interact with the entities in the third realm, at least when it comes to mathematical entities. That is, Frege developed a conception of abstraction and provided a bunch of abstraction principles, say Hume's principle to abstract over equinomerosity of concepts, extensions, and to get numbers, or another notorious abstraction principle to abstract over parallelness of lines and get directions. Uh, I mean, those abstraction principles, which are uh, heavily discussed in neofraganism and in Linebo mentioned today also. Yeah. So is Frege's abstraction a kind of relation on which a cognitive agent may stand to the object in the third realm? What do you think? Okay, so he, Frege never put it that way. Um, if you look at, um, there is some stuff on this on the, in the chapter on numbers in the 2019 book. Um, so if you look at Frege, let's take the very simple case of, of directions being abstracted from uh, parallelism and relations, that the direction of line A is direction of, identical to the direction of line B, just in case A is parallel to B. Um, and then he considers the corresponding position for numbers um, in the in the Grundlagen. And he says, well, this is no good because it doesn't determine whether Julius Caesar is a number, right? Isn't that so subject, right? Um, now, from the point of view of definition or linguistic formulation, that is indeed an objection because he hasn't said whether this sentence, Julius Caesar is such and such number, or Julius Caesar is a direction. Um, that is an objection. But from the point of view of metaphysics, um, things look very differently. So if you take a case in which um, I'm, I'm happy to say, I don't mind saying, this is different from the neo Phrygian program, but I, I don't mind saying that um, uh, natural numbers are abstracted from um, numerical quantifiers. There are five or there are six or whatnot. That's, that's okay by me. Um, but when you speak in terms, not of linguistic definition, but in terms of individuating an entity, um, then matters look very different because um, uh, Julius Caesar is not individuated by um, an abstraction operator and their operation, and therefore Julius Caesar is not um, is not either a direction or a natural number or anything else that might be abstracted. Um, so that's then in the realm of metaphysics, not in the realm of definition. Um, so what what you don't get in Frege is any connection of whatever the fundamental ontology is. I mean, you're quite right. He has abstraction principles for courses of values and so forth, but they're all over some initial ontology, whatever the initial um, range of entities is, there's, there's some background range of the, of the quantifiers. Um, 
I think you need something like um, what I call individuation by application. That's in the in the chapter on numbers, um, and that does that does connect. This is um, and this connects much more with the issues that Artem was interested in. Um, when you say that grasp of a natural number consists in some kind of tacit knowledge of its individuating condition then you really are connecting the metaphysics with with the third with the realm of abstract objects in this case and you can do a similar thing for senses um but Frege didn't do that he he he, di he, he didn't really ever say what what understanding consists in i mean you, you can do a local thing you can say understanding course of values is just understanding this abstraction principle but then you've got the question of what's in the range of the quantifiers on the on the right hand side of the the abstraction principle um so he, he really didn't talk about understanding and i think i mean zooming off in a different direction but i think that's really the the starting point of um wittgenstein's later philosophy when when wittgenstein said i wish i could have written like frege i think he was absolutely sincere in that and i think it's also true that if you ask what was wittgenstein doing both early and late um he was trying to fill in gaps in the Fregean, um the Fregean framework basically having to do with understanding and of course it's a totally different theory it's allegedly not going to go be in terms of reference to truth and so forth um but i think the the absence of an account of grasp, the absence of an account of the relation between especially the mental realm and the third realm, that's just a huge gap in Frege. It's not, you know, no one can do everything. Um, so it's, in a certain sense, it's not a criticism, but it, it's our job to fill it. If you think there's notion of sense at all that makes sense, then something has to be said about that, that whole relation here. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually, I do agree that the Julius Caesar problem is a very important epistemological challenge for Fregian program, and probably, uh, well, at least how it is presented by some uh, interpreters, uh, probably most notably Crispin Wright and Bob Hale, and so yeah. on. Uh, yeah. and and probably because of Julius Caesar problem, Frege uh, introduced his uh, his notorious BLV, right? At least, at least neo Fregians claim so, and yeah. I buy his the the yeah. argument, in fact. Yeah. Yeah, so I think Frege, I mean, this this is a really important question. There's a certain sense in which Frege didn't do metaphysics. I mean, he was worried about linguistic context containing the words Julius Caesar. That's an issue of definition of, um, uh, it's a linguistic issue. But the individuation of a, a natural number by its condition for being the number of F, so the individuation of a direction by it simply being the, um, uh, condition for these lines being parallel. Um, that's metaphysics. So I would distinguish very, very sharply between issues of individuation and issues of definition. And Frege didn't distinguish them. So I, what I would like to say is that, um, I, I don't want to say it's wrong or anything, but I think he he missed an avenue. There was an avenue that was open to him that he didn't, he didn't go down. Um, uh, and he could have, but that's, yeah. And what's more, um, when you do it in terms of individuation, you naturally get a hierarchy. And so, you know, Russell's Russell's paradox and the application of Russell's style paradox to the course of values operator and abstraction. Um, when you talk about the individuation of one entity by its relation to other entities, um, a, a principle well-foundedness or a foundation is, is completely compelling. Um, and uh, he wouldn't have needed to formulate his, um, his axiom five uh, that way, um, he he could have had a um, a hierarchy, uh, and it, what you end up with is not exactly logicism, but you end up with an account on which arithmetic is in is generated by these individuation principles, um, rather than being stuck in something that's too linguistic. There's there's more stuff on that in the chapter on numbers in um, 
in the primacy of, of metaphysics. That's the there's an individuationist metaphysical line that's different from the neo Freakian line and also different from Hit Fine's approach too. Um, and I think it I think it ultimately helps a Freakian conception of sense, but it does so only by having a certain kind of conception with connection with the metaphysics. Okay, thank you. Anyway, thank you for the discussion. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'll send you a link to the recording. The recording is still proceeding. I will I'll send that to you later. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Nice to see you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.